Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Barbara Hartzler. Uh, Barbara, hey. uh, she's an Urban Fantasy Academy author who's published, by the time this is Aaron, 11 books. Uh, she's, she's also a former student at SBS and now uh, a fiction author coach at Self Publishing School. Um, she's coached hundreds of authors, so over 400 authors. Um, that she's coached with over 1,400 one-on-one -on -one coaching calls completed. So not only is she practicing um, and, and has a wildly successful um, fiction career, um, she's also in the trenches coaching fiction authors uh, to, to succeed, whether it's their first book, their third book, uh, or you know any, anywhere in between. Um, she's got a lot of great experience that she can speak from. And so this is going to be a fun interview. We're going to dive into a lot of things fiction. So whether you're just getting started in your fiction journey or whether you've published a bunch of books and you're looking to take your fiction career to the next level, uh, I think you'll find this uh, really, really helpful. So Barbara, welcome. Great to have you. Hi, great to be here. Thanks, Chandler. <laughs> so uh, let's start. Um, How did you find self-publishing school originally? Why did you decide to join? And, and I'm forgetting right now. It was, had you published your first fiction book yet? Yes. Okay. I had two published books out. Um, probably for five years on my own mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was you know I'm one of those people I did everything wrong so I can totally relate to my students when they tell me I did this and I tried that you know I did everything wrong in the beginning you should see my first cover it is terrible <laughs> <laughs> in fact I think I'm on my third cover iteration we might end up going for four you know yeah um, but I did everything wrong um on my own for five years. And before that, I actually tried getting traditionally published as well. So I was pitching to agents and editors and you know, notes on that kind of stuff. And I actually had like a contract with a small press and then they went bankrupt. I was fortunate to get my rights back uh, without being wow. entangled yeah. in anything. Mm -hmm. But um, I had this book and I'm like, what do I do? And my friends were like, why don't you self-publish? Let's do it, we'll all do it together. And we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> and so I had um, two books out. Um, over the course of five years, um, before I came to self publishing school, and I was just like, I have book three and I want to get this out, but I know I'm doing a lot of things wrong. And mm. so I started looking for ways I could train myself, do things right. I was looking at a bunch of different podcasts and watching all the right podcasts and I was just still not getting it. Mm. Um, and so I wanted someone to actually teach me <laughs> how the step-by-step -step strategies uh, because that's kind of how my brain works. I want the step-by-step -step strategies. Um, the big picture is great. I need to know that as well, but I also need to know what happens next. <laughs> mm. And yeah. so that's what I found when I came to SPS is they had some really good videos, really good strategies and would walk you through all of the steps and how it would work for you and your genre and all of this. And so um, that's why I came to self-publishing school as a student. And then um, I had to relaunch everything mm -hmm. and recover everything and research my genre and uh, figure out how what the market that I was supposed to be targeting and how to target it as well. And so when I did relaunch, I already had two books ready, which was nice. And so mm. I just, you know, kind of bam, bam launch and then, you know, get books three and four out. In fact, um, when I relaunched those books, they were so successful. I got the market right. I targeted it right. And I had to uh, like, okay, now I got to finish book three and four and five in the whole series. Oh, okay, go. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to hurry up and launch. Not the worst thing ever, you know. That is, <laughs> that is a high quality well. problem. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> when you've got people chasing you for your new, uh, for your next They, they want the next book, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great problem to have. Yeah. So talk to me about that. So, um, so you joined SBS, you, you went through a fiction mm -hmm. program, you started working with yes. Rami. Uh, how did you relaunch those books? Okay, um, yeah. and, and, how, and how was that different than the first time that you launched it? Okay, that's a really good question. And um, for most people that come in not knowing the market at all, and so that was my main issue, is I was targeting the wrong market. Um, so my book has this girl with angel powers. And so I was targeting any young adult book with angels and they were all like angel romances and falling in love with angels. And that's not my book at all. She's kind of this, you know, badass heroine who kicks butt and has these cool powers. And so um, I did market research. And so here we call that the tier one process. Look for your tier one authors and figure out your genre. It's a lengthy process. We get to read a lot of books. I'm a reader, so I didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> and um, I found that there was this academy genre and I, you know, had my um, characters go into this boarding school. And so all I had to do was change the name of the boarding school to an academy. 
And then, you know, and then there's this whole market that opened up for me. And so when I relaunched the book, I, I figured out exactly what I did wrong. <laughs> and then I figured out um, what the market is doing that is selling well. So I had to look at indie books in the academy market that were selling well and why they were selling well. And so a lot of them, mm. they had similar cover templates and um, were doing their blurbs a certain way and using certain keywords and categories and things like that. And so once I did all of those things right and relaunched it, you know, I, um, that's kind of what helped the launch go so well is because I just look like every other Academy book out there mm. and it was easier to try a new author with an unknown name if I look like ah. their favorite Academy book. So mm. <laughs> got it. So doing yep. tier one research as, as you and Ronnie that's teach right. yes. and, <laughs> uh, and doing that to find your target market. And it's almost mm -hmm. like, you know, if you're, if you're an unknown author, it, it, there needs to be cons some consistency or certainty for the reader. And so if they know for sure, yes. this is at least in a genre that mm -hmm. I like in a genre that I want to read in. And that part's very clear then. Yeah. Okay. I'm more likely to, to, to buy it. Even if I don't know the author's name, is that kind of the exactly. thought process? There? Yeah, that's the thought process there. There are some other things that go into it as well. Like um, identifying certain tropes that readers like to read that sort of thing. And, you know, that just kind of ups the ante there, but mm. <laughs> um, and, as long as you telegraph that genre really well. <laughs> got it. And, and for uh, super beginner um, fiction authors, what's a trope and why is that import important <laughs> to identify the trope yeah, and so, meet expectations? Uh, that's a really good question. I get that all the time. <laughs> um, so tropes are basically um, kind of common expected things that happen in a book. And so there are universal tropes that apply to any genre. Your love triangle is a trope that you can use in any genre. Your band of friends, um, your Scooby gang, if you will. Um, uh, so basically those are some universal tropes and there are certain tropes that apply to um, certain genres as well. Um, so in romance, you have your second chance romance or your enemies to lovers, that sort of thing. In my genre in urban fantasy, there's usually some kind of chosen one trope like Harry Potter, um, some kind of quest to find something in mine. I have a quest that she has to find her missing brother, that sort of thing. And so hitting those tropes kind of gives readers like a mile marker, like, oh, I know it's going to be in this book, but I also want to see how this author twists that, you know, trope. So it's not a cliche, so that it is interesting. And so it gives them an idea of what to expect, but then they also want to see how you kind of twist and change that and make it unique. And that's what set your books apart. And so when you're using tropes or and targeting tier ones, you want to show the trope that you're using and show how you kind of make it different and special. And mm. that's what draws new readers in. They're like, oh, I like this trope, but your twist looks fun too. So I'm intrigued now. I want to read it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, and I'm sure a lot of fiction authors or fiction readers will instantly relate to that. Yes, um, and then just sure. to maybe even make this more accessible for everyone is, is uh, I think movies, right? It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I, this is a rom-com or hey, yes, what do you want to watch? Sure. Oh, <laughs> let's watch a rom-com or let's yeah. watch an action movie or let's watch mm -hmm. a, whatever. So, so there's an expectation with that genre. And then I'm interested yes. in this specific one yeah. because <laughs> all of the reasons that you said, right? And so right. it's the, the same one when people are, are deciding which books to buy. Let's I want to talk a lot of takeaways from your journey, and then I want to dive into lessons that you've learned sure. uh, uh, from, from coaching a bunch of students. And for people who are new students that are watching this, maybe Barbara's your coach and you're preparing for your first coaching call. We'll have some lessons <laughs> in here. Uh, and then for people who are uh, you know, watching or listening to this who um, are a student or are not a student yet, um, maybe this will be helpful for you regardless of whether you end up working with us. So um, let's go into, uh, fast forward to today, you're about to publish your 11th book. What are the top? <laughs> yes, yeah, crazy. That's exciting. Um, what are the top uh, two to three things that have sold the most books? Oh, goodness. That's a really good question. The top two to three things that sell the most books. Um, I do think the cover is the starting point. You have to have a good cover. Um, in the beginning, I did my own covers, and now I have a, a tier one cover designer, and there is a big difference there. Um, and then um, I feel like getting your categories and keywords right is really important. And so that does um, mean you need to know some of the tropes in your genre. You can know some of the um, lingo that's going to be used when people search. And so, you know, I use some really good tools for that. And I help my students figure out those tools as well. Um, but those are the things that I can think of that um, sell the most books is um, anything you can do, like I said earlier, to telegraph your genre. And that starts with the cover. And then um, it goes into the blurb as well. And, you know, getting them hooked in right away and showing them, you know, why they want to read that book. 
That's great. Those are great tips. Um, I was going uh, through your Amazon profile oh, earlier today, and I mean, one, two, at least two or three um, books of yours have over 200 reviews on Amazon. Yeah. Um, how, how did you do it? And any advice for fiction authors looking to get more reviews of their book? Um, so in the beginning, I actually um, used a perma-free strategy, which is an old strategy to get my first 75 reviews and to get my first like thousand newsletter subscribers. Um, and since then, um, I've actually kind of incorporated those readers into my launch team. And so I do have a launch team of at least 100 people um, where I give the book away free um, in, in exchange for an honest review. <laughs> and so a lot of people will actually um, download the book and they want to support me, they want to help me. Um, but my goal is to get reviews from my launch team. That is my purpose there. And so, um, I actually really um, encourage them and inspire them. I give them like snippets of reviews, like here's the good reviews, look at these, or, you know, I kind of will uh, uh, make teams out of it. Like the US has five reviews over here. The UK has 10, come on, you the US, you gotta pick it up. So I try to keep it interesting on my launch team, um, but they do get some free stuff and then they get, um, you know, cool updates from me. So um, having a launch team with my readers in the genre focus does really help a lot with getting reviews and then opening it up when I do have new subscribers I was in my newsletter, so I open it up every now and then like right before new launch, I might open up the launch team to my current newsletter subscribers. So that's one of the benefits you get if you get on my newsletter. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I, 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 let's talk box sets. Um, sure. So Ooh, that's a big uh, strategy right there. <laughs> yeah, right. And I mean, you've got 280 reviews on your box set um, and it's it seems to be one of the top sellers of, of your books. Yes. So I guess specifically, who should do a box set? Um, who should do it and when should when does it make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so and what are, did you learn from doing it? Yep. Yeah, there are some schools of thought on that. You'll hear conflicting advice on that. Um, I I go back to the tier one approach, look at what's going on in your genre and what's happening. And so this is something that my coach, Rami, <laughs> he made me do a 99 cent box set. And I was like, I don't want to do a 99 cent box set. But I did because everyone in urban fantasy is doing 99 cent box sets. And um, the key to that is bundling a bunch of books together. And so I have like five and a half. I have like a bridge book between my series. It's technically book six in the series. And so I have six books to give away. And and lots of pages read, and that's um, what makes it the top seller. So the 99 cent price point actually gives it visibility. And um, if, if people buy the 99 cent book, you're getting the best deal there. But if you want to read on Kindle Unlimited, I make way more than 99 cents on 2,500 pages that you read. And so that's the strategy there. Um, I will say that for me, I don't like to do a box set until some of my sales start to drop for the original series. And so um, that differs from me a little bit, honestly. <laughs> um, but uh, there are cliffs that your book falls off of if it's so old. And so I don't think I started this box set until at least a year, maybe a year and a half after the first mm. book came out um, so that I could boost some interest in that as well. And so um, that actually, funnily enough, boosted the interest in the in the regular books by themselves yeah. as well as the box yeah. set. Because it is a different audience. There are people mm -hmm. who want that completed series or if you want the um, just box set, they just want to read box set. That's all they read. So yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and it so is. <laughs> you, you open up a different. Well, so it sounds like there's a lot of benefits. And so if there I'm are a lot hearing, of benefits for sure. <laughs> if I'm hearing correctly, it's okay. You launch the individual books, mm -hmm. and if and yes. when those sales start to taper, your personal yeah. kind of philosophy is that's when you launch the box set. Right. Now the box mm -hmm. set will there it'll open up a new audience that just wants mm -hmm. to buy box sets yeah it'll, mm -hmm. it sounds like for you it also lifted sales of individual books yes yeah, so you just get more awareness box set series mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you've got more awareness around those books um and then um just all kind of other benefits can you so you said you were resistant to do a 99 cent box set. I know like, it's just like giving away six books for 99 cents just feels wrong. <laughs> yeah. So so any any thoughts for people? Because I imagine a lot of people like, oh my gosh, I spent so much time, uh, yeah. you know, creating all of these books, and I'm going to sell them for mm -hmm. 99 cents. Why do that? Does it? You know, who does it make sense for? That sort of thing. Um. So it makes sense for your genre and then you have to look at your genre and see what they're listing their box sets for um to be competitive in my genre everyone was listening to their box set 99 cents and so i just was like okay if i list my box set for 9.99 
that's gonna, you know, be pointless. I'm gonna, you know, not get the lift that I need. And so it's one of those things like, I am like, I'll just try it, see how it goes. And it went really well right out of the gate because the 99 cent price point gives you that visibility and it keeps your ranking up. And you, as you saw, you did the research yourself, you know, you know, it's still ranking high and it's been nine months, I want to say, that it's been out there for the first one. And so now I'm just kind of working on getting the, the new, um, the second series done so I can do a, a second box set because that does just lifts everything up overall. So whenever you have a launch, it lifts all your books up overall. But the box set um, really is kind of an engine of its own for a big moneymaker. Um, you get all those reviews on that box set are pretty much working. I maybe had five people on my launch and leave a review. So oh <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So let, let's, uh, this is kind of a related note. I know mm -hmm. you and Rami both talk a lot about read through rate. Um, yes. What is it and why is it important for fiction authors who want to sell books? Go for So that's a really good question as well. Read through rate is really important for building your uh, readership, your fan base, and for earning money. So those of us who say, I don't want to earn money on a book. Um, do you want readers? Readers pay you for your books. <laughs> and so um, the read through rate actually kind of tells you if your um, series is going well. And so when we talk about read through, we're talking mostly about series um, where it's, you know, hard enough to get people into book one. And then once you do, um, if 50% of those go to book two, that's a good sign. That's actually normal. And that means your book one is doing its job. If it's above 50% great, if it's below, you have problems with book one, you want to go check it out, what the, what the issues are over there. Um, but once you get people into um, book two, and then you have like, I think it's like 75, 80% read through to book three. And then once you get them to book three in the series, you get 80 to 90% read through rate through the rest of your series. You got them hooked by book three. And so just having a series with a read through rate and monitoring it like that, um, that shows you that A, you're doing a good job writing your books and B, you're building a, um, a fan base and they want more books. And so if the read, if read through rate tapers off at some point, you might wanna, you know, in that series, start a new one sort of thing. So it gives you some signs to look for, um, but readers just kind of expect series nowadays. And so um, and we need to kind of monitor those and monetize those. <laughs> yeah, and it's one of the s single simplest ways to sell more books. Right? There's only three ways to grow any business and especially your author business. There's more readers or customers. There's mm -hmm. increasing the average order value and increasing the lifetime value, right? So right. more readers, this is more, more people buying the book than average mm -hmm. order value. That's things like a, a box set maybe, or mm -hmm. it's things like multiple formats or that sort right. of thing. But then that lifetime value is probably the most important thing. A lot of people mm -hmm. focus on the more, the more readers, like first time yeah. readers, but, but when you nail that, that read through rate, uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's how you ultimately get the majority of your growth. And then that sparks to referrals mm -hmm. and, and, and so many things kind of bottle up mm -hmm. into one. Absolutely. I want to go one more question on your journey, and then we'll go through some sure. takeaways from coaching students. So I, I, you've experienced, experimented a lot with different covers. I've just seen yes. over the last year or two, um, mm -hmm. as you've been working on your books, um, any lessons learned from that? Uh, mm -hmm. And how does that work? And, and what would your tips be to, a lot of times I think people just think, oh, I've launched the book. I can't change the cover. Um, <laughs> you've done it. And I think it's no. worked well. So any, anything you've learned there? Um, yeah. So um, like I said in the beginning, I wanted to make sure I learned my genre and what covers work well. And so having a cover that can teach your genre is really important. Um, but the covers do change over time. Um, there is kind of a life cycle of what works in your genre and what doesn't. My books have been out, my relaunched books have been out for two years now. And so I'm thinking, oh, I probably need to go back to series one and, and redo the covers. And um, that's kind of what professional authors in my genre do. And so um, the cover design trends do change. Every genre has a different cover design updated trend, to be honest with you. So you kind of got to watch your market. In my genre, um, we have these, you know, bright colors or whatever in this certain template and this cool lighting effects you just gotta have or magic and now we have these new 3d looking figures so you get more lighting effects and more magic and so that's kind of the upgrade in my genre we're going that direction that sort of thing and so I'm like okay so we're gonna have to redo some of these covers but usually it's worth the effort especially if like you were talking about before you want to get new readers that's a good way to bring new readers in like oh look at this new cover or, you know that sort of thing and so um Staying on top of the cover design trends is important, but you need to also make sure it makes sense with your budget and your earnings and all that. But um, 
don't be afraid to recover. It usually, uh, if you know why you want to recover and the target that you want to hit with that, then um, absolutely go for it. Mm, that's awesome. Now, so a couple fun stats. Barbara has over 40,000 books sold uh, and 7.8 million page reads. So uh, this is advice from in the trenches. Uh, and speaking <laughs> of advice from in the trenches, let's go. Uh, so I mentioned this earlier, she's coached over 400 students and 1,418 coaching calls, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so can you talk to me, Barbara, about uh, number one challenge that you see students face throughout the, the, the process? What is it? Oh, goodness. There's a lot of challenges they face. Number one is going to be tricky. <laughs> um, I say number one is um, trying to think of themselves as a publisher. Um, it's difficult. Uh, it's the writing, the book is your baby. And, you know, learning all the publishing is very difficult. Um, it is a process and people want to do all the things. And that's just not realistic. And so the, all the things that you want to do applies to pretty much every stage. I want to do all the things in my rough draft and get the best rough draft possible. Well, that's not actually possible. Your brain doesn't really work that way. You probably need to separate it out into a rough draft where it's just ideas and then a second draft where it's, you know, fleshing out those ideas and making the scenery and the characters and everything pretty. In fact, that's what I call my second draft, the pretty draft. And so that's the mistake that most people make in the beginning is, you know, trying to do all the things at once and sometimes separating them out and doing things one by one actually is going to um, serve you better and going to actually get you where you want to go faster. And so that mm. also applies in learning the publishing industry as well. You want to do all the launch teams and the newsletters and everything right away. And it is a process and um, mm. kind of compartmentalizing some of that stuff actually helps your brain um, deal with all the things that you want to deal with faster. <laughs> Instead of all at once, let's just go ahead and yeah. go at a steady pace. And that's kind of my coaching style is I coach people through each step of the process. If they need a big picture checkup, sure, I get that. I understand mm. I need a picture knowledge as well, see where I'm going. But I also want to, you know, let you know that this is the time to do this and this is the time to do that. And you don't have to do mm -hmm. everything right this second. <laughs> mm. So steady pace. That's one right. Thing yeah. at a, one thing at a time. Don't try to do everything all at once. Yeah. Now, what about, what do you see as the biggest thing, biggest obstacle that either keeps people from getting started with their book or keeps mm -hmm. people from finishing and publishing their first book? Um, so those are really two different points, pain points that I think we can address there. Getting started with the book. Um, a lot of people just have too many ideas and they don't know how to formulate it into a novel. This is not something that we're taught in school how to write novels and how to fictionalize things and write good characters. Um, so that is a learning process. Um, but there are ways that you can um, just kind of conceptualize the ideas. We have a five milestone system here that um, really just helps you get the gist of the story out and then you can start writing or plot further down depending on your writing style. Um, and so getting those ideas formulated in a direction is the most helpful thing you can do to get started. And then also kind of like I mentioned earlier, realize and that you don't have to do that perfect first draft, that you need to break it up and um, get the ideas out in that first draft and then worry about the perfect prose in the second draft. And then um, the second pain point that most people run into um, is actually during editing. Um, but your first experience with an editor can be challenging. Yeah. Um, I had people coming and crying to me about things and wanting to give up. Um, but usually a good editor is going to help you see where your weaknesses are. And that way you can focus on those sections of learn. And that way you don't have to mm. do all the things. You probably are doing yeah. some things right. Yeah. And so the, a good editor will show you what you're doing right and help you figure out um, how to fix what you're doing wrong. <laughs> yeah. And so um, that's probably um, where people get bottlenecked on getting published is that um, you take that take that hit the criticism from the editor is only going to make you better as a writer and make your book better and it's going to be um, something that readers want to read and come back to when you read the whole series so mm. all works together for sure <laughs> so good uh what would you say barbara is uh, a common the, a common trait or traits of your most successful students or most successful authors good question so my most successful students, authors, um, they basically have this persistent attitude. Even if things go wrong, I'm going to figure out how to make it work, how to move around this obstacle, um, how to power through. Um, not everything goes according to plan. Um, even for those of us who know what we're doing now, I still have issues with launches and, you know, 
every part of the process has issues. And so that's what made me successful is finding a way to um, tackle all the obstacles and put out all the fires <laughs> and, um, and not let it bring me down and not let it yeah. stop me and get me stuck. Mm -hmm. And so moving around your obstacles um, through over, I don't care how you move around them. <laughs> as long as you uh, find a way that works for you, um, yeah. that's going to be the thing that brings you through um, a, to get a book published and B to have an author career as well. You got to be persistent for the whole author career. There's always going to be something new to learn, a new place to grow for sure. Mm. Last question on the observations from students, and hopefully this is helpful for people who are about to hop on their first coaching call with you. Uh, 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 or for, <laughs> is uh, how can students best prepare for that first coaching call? I know one of the first steps that you and all of our fiction coaches and all of our coaches in general, it's, it's in nonfiction is a clarity call, but in fiction, it's a plot call and getting super mm -hmm. clear um, on your plot, who you're writing to, all that. How can uh, new students best prepare for that first coaching call? Good question. Um, so the first coaching call, I like to go over um, A, what their story is about and B, um, what their author goals are. And so um, the first video in the course is all about our five milestones structure that we use for um, plotting out stories. And so having that ready is going to help me um, address your story issues, whether you've written the book already or not. Um, I still want to know what goes into the story so that we make sure that there are no holes, there are no um, glaring genre issues, that sort of thing. That's my job, I feel like, to help you figure out A, your genre and your market and how that story fits in there. Um, something Rami did for me and my stories in the beginning and so I just want to pay it forward for sure <laughs> and so um, that's the best thing you can do is a know your story and b take a stab at your five milestones and the structure if you don't know it fine I love figuring it out with you I have all the ideas in the world I can throw at you <laughs> you know it's usually a fun call when we um, look at it that way um, but there are some people who are resistant to changing their story and things like that so just be open-minded about suggestions that come your way um, because this is not the first time you're going to get suggestions you're going to have editors and reviews and people along the process so just be mm. open-minded yeah um, that's the biggest thing I would say for your first coaching call is let me hear your story and let me hear about your articles as well <laughs> mm. yeah that's great and I know, uh, you know, a lot of times our, our, our fiction program and coaching is just so in demand that it might be two, three, four weeks or whatever else yeah. and, <laughs> until your first call. And I know a lot of students can get antsy about that. Mm -hmm. And I love that advice of go into the curriculum uh, yeah. and uh, that we have and do the hard work to start formulating if you haven't already, um, mm -hmm. the, the five part story structure and what is the, the story arc um for for yeah. your book and 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 that way the, and and then and i know rami says this is like and then also do the hard work but then don't be too attached to it yes um, because sure. you <laughs> might come into that first call and and get some really good but tough advice of like hey you got to mm -hmm. make a lot of changes and so yeah. be prepared for that uh and and it's it, it, we'd rather give you tough feedback up front and sure. that's gonna make your book better then years from now, the book isn't selling. And you're like, why in the world is this not selling? Uh, mm -hmm. And so kind of rip the Band-Aid off in that way. Uh, yes. Barbara, knowing what you know now, what would be your advice to the Barbara from years ago <laughs> uh, who hadn't written her uh, first fiction book and all the other Barbaras out there who are <laughs> kind of about thinking about or about to mm -hmm. um, write their first fiction book? Um, I do wish I had joined SPS sooner. I will be honest there. <laughs> Shameless plug here. Um, but um, I think the, the best advice that I can give is kind of what I um, talked about earlier is just be persistent. There's lots of things to learn. There's lots of ways to grow. And um, having people to help you is going to be the most important thing, whether it's SPS or a writing group. Um, you do need that outside input in order to um, grow and um learn a the fiction craft and be the publishing process it's a lot to learn up front and so just be prepared um, to uh, kind of uh, get lost in the weeds and figure out the, all these things you don't know and eventually you will master them <laughs> that's awesome barbara you you and rami have a ton of fiction authors uh, uh that have already got grabbed the ticket for author advantage live oh, we might we might set a record <laughs> Uh, yes. for uh, fiction attendees at Author Advantage Represent. Live this year. <laughs> so if, if people are listening to or watching this, um, why should they uh, come to Author Advantage Live this year? 
fiction authors. Author Bridge Live is a really good conference, and I do think that um, there are some good things to learn, A, from some of the general talks that address any authors, and B, there are going to be some, some fiction-specific sides of things <laughs> that um, go into it, and so um, the la last year's conference was amazing, and um, we had a bunch of great speakers talking about all the aspects that you need to learn about, and so they're just kind of I don't know. I feel like it's a mind-blowing conference, and whether you're um, uh, in your rough draft phase or you're working on publishing your third book, there's there's still something to learn, and there's yeah. a lot of people there to learn from, and uh, there's even people make friends there, and they have connections in their little even the virtual conference they have a little Zoom yeah. room connections, and so it's really a great experience to a learn from industry experts and b um, hang out with other people that you know are just weird like you. We're all writers. We're all <laughs> welcome to the club. You found people. Come join us. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Well, hey guys, if you haven't already, if you're watching this, like, or if you're watching or listening to this, and it's pretty, you know, right when this comes out, grab a ticket uh, before prices <laughs> go up, and the event's happening real soon. So, um, grab a ticket uh, at authoradvantagelive.com. If you're watching or listening to this after the fact, grab a ticket for for the next year. Uh, yep, event we'd love to this. see you there uh <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of fun so uh barbara this has been amazing thank you so much yeah, uh, thanks. Where, can, it's been fun. Where, where can people go uh to to buy your books uh and to support what you're doing as an author yeah um so barbarahartzler.com it's a fun name <laughs> you spell it out right <laughs> you'll get there i'm also on amazon as well um so i have two series out the montrose paranormal academy and the shadowstone academy series and there'll be another one next year so I'll just keep on uh looking for more books for me <laughs> all right two series out uh in a brand new book um that just launched shadowstone academy book three um, check it out, <laughs> uh, barbarahartzler.com. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if you'd like to uh, inquire about self-publishing school and our, our, our fiction program, the Fundamentals of Fiction and Story, or our full-time fiction program, uh, and maybe just maybe you'll be coached by Barbara. Who knows? She is stays pretty Bye. booked up. <laughs> uh, so either her or one of our other fiction uh, coaches, go to self-publishingschool.com forward slash apply book a call with the team. We'd be happy to chat with you about, about your book, your goals for your book, your next steps, and how we might be able to help. So uh, you can book a call with the team and we'd love to chat with you about your book. Barbara, thank you so much. Yeah, hope to coach you soon. <laughs>